FP Live is back in what year is it? Anyone? 2024? Okay, cool. Happy New Year, people. We are back. It felt like we've been gone forever. It only been about a week. Braun, Kratz, Przinsky. We got the big hitters today. Ken Rosenthal is going to join us pretty soon. And Tony Maserati will make his FT Live debut to talk about the Red Sox state of pitching. Um, and David O'Brien later on the brave side of the Chris Sale trade, which we'll get to in a sec. Happy New Year. AJ, why don't you kick us off back from international waters? How you doing, dude? I am tired. I got home about an hour ago <laughs> from 30 hours of travel. 30? So, well, yeah, we left it. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. A long time ago. And yeah, when do you know, technical difficulties on a plane aren't always good. So, you know. <laughs> Missed connectors, spending nights in random places. Yeah, it was, it was a fun trip. Okay, we'll allow you to get some sleep this evening, perhaps, unless the rest of the free agents sign in the next, I don't know, 12 hours. But Kratz, we still got about half the dudes left on the board, if not more, of like the top 40. So you missed a little. You didn't miss everything. But I will say the front offices did not let their people chill during the past week, at least some of them. You know, I was. it's not like there was a ton that happened, but... It was not a total chill out session. There's probably about five to 10 moves that are worth pointing out that we'll get to in a sec. Especially if we see those moves, I'd like to know how much was actually going on behind the scenes. There had to be somebody that was like, dog, just, just call me later. Like I'll, I'll be here. You call me, just call me January 2nd and we'll, we'll start the negotiations up again. Like not everybody wants to do stuff over Christmas, especially when you're, when you're crushing spread, like a, like a rookie that just got called up. Easy. And AJ, did you, is it the first time you've ever flown one year and then gotten there the next year? Because if you were flying for 30 hours, <laughs> you could have left, depending on where you were, you could have left in 23 and gotten there in 24. Uh, no, because we left January 1st. So we left after New Year's. It's January 2nd, they crouch. January 2nd of this year or of last year? Mm -hmm. See, you're tired. You don't even remember. Oh, I know what you're January saying. January 1st. You <laughs> left on the first. January 2nd. Arrived on the 2nd. Yes. Brilliant math. I'll, I'll um, finish with this one because I'm still in Argentina right now doing a show. And so for all the players who complain sometimes about their Wi-Fi, stop it. We've been in multiple countries doing shows and we're fine. They need to figure it out. Um, but oh, I did a show from a cruise ship. In the yeah, you were on a ship. I mean, in the middle of the ocean. So let's, let's, let's slow our roll on the internet. Can't work trick. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying I mean, 2024. Shohei Otani had technical difficulties after he won the MVP to do a press conference. I mean, come on. That's you my New Year's ship. resolution. 2024, everyone get cleaner internet. Thank you. Um, Bob Nightingale, why don't you kick us off with our first tweet of the new year? Happy New Year. Spring training starts in six weeks. Let's go. A lot of dudes are nervous. They don't know where they're going with their fans for spring training. But we'll get there. I hated this. I hated this time of year. As a player, I was excited about If you're about not baseball. signed, you're saying. What's that? If you're not signed or even if you're signed? Even if I'm signed. Because you just had all the Christmas, all the hoopla. Now you're like, wait a minute, I got six weeks. And for me, I would always go seven to ten days early to spring training. And I'm like, oh, man, like you have to finish everything that you need done at the house in the next month to five weeks and it just felt like it was like uh, January 1st January 2nd was always a day so for me to see that six weeks I'm excited as a fan but I still have that feeling of like there was times I didn't have a place to live yet and I'm not you know I'm not able to shell out 10 grand a month to just find a house anywhere you want so it was and I didn't want to live in the hotel with my family so it was it was a it took me about a week until then I was like, okay, I got everything. I got my schedule going. I know exactly what's going to happen for the next month. I'm going to get everything done and enjoy the time at home. And then it's really time to go. <laughs> I 
Agreed. I showed up the day before, the last second, because <laughs> I hated spring trading. <laughs> I would show up the last possible <laughs> second I could show up. You didn't was, even make the team. You know what was funny is I used to always remember the year Manny didn't show up until like the mandatory reporting date. I was like, what if I just did that? I just showed up the mandate, whatever. It was always like March 1st. What if you miss like the first like 12 days of spring training? We're like, yeah. I think we guys. should do that. I think they should do that for a player like you. I think they should do that. I had to show up. People were like, oh, you can't make the team your first day, all that stuff. If I didn't show up, because I was going to probably start the first day of camp. If I didn't show up and I couldn't throw the ball down to second base at my peak potential, then they're going to be like, oh, we'll never call this guy up in May, in June from AAA. But I, I honestly think they shouldn't have – the stars show up to spring training yet because it can't shrink spring training. You still need all those games, but I don't think I don't think the big dogs need to show up for a week and a half. I would have been all for that. that would, I'm still all for that, shrinking it down. But we'll, we'll table that. We'll get to it. Well, another listen, day. the owners make too much time. money off spring training. They don't pay anybody in spring training. You, you, they don't pay players in spring training. So all the money they make, all the revenue they generate, all goes right in their pocket. They, all the people that show up to these games, they don't pay the players, man. It's crazy. It's like the biggest racket going that no one talks about. Also, they don't pay for those ballparks for the most part. The towns and cities do. So they need to give them their time since they gave them their tax dollars. We'll get to more of that at another time. Let's charge the damn mound. Powered by Tisa. No nicotine, no tobacco. Check it out. TeaseEnergy.com. We'll give you a discount code on the back end of this. There it is on the bottom. You want to start with Chris Sale? Was that the most surprising move, maybe, in the last week or so? No, I think no, that was the probably the most Red surprising. Sox, he's yeah, Red Sox sending a message that they'll take on Lucas Giolito, but they need to clear some money, and they do. So the Braves pick up the seven-time All-Star in a trade with the Red Sox. Just one prospect goes back. A prospect I like, a guy who's been on the show multiple times, Vaughn Grissom, um, infield prospect. He was working on some outfield action this offseason, too, and they send some money back. And Sal had to waive his no trade clause, which I'm sure he was happy to do to go to ATL. So is this it for you? Let's start with the Atlanta side, AJ. Is this it for you? If the Braves pretty much wrap up their offseason right now, and there's the money, by the way, $27.5 million in 2024. He's got a 20 mil club option, which they're obviously not going to pick up or not likely to pick up. Boston sends $17 million to Atlanta as part of the deal. So if you look at the math, it's about $10.5 million dollars this coming season for Chris Sale. I like that move if he stays on the mound and can stay healthy. I mean, if you look at what guys were getting in the offseason here, I, I think he would have gotten probably around that range, if not a little bit more. So your thoughts on the Atlanta side first? Because it seems like Braves fans are like, this could not be it yet. We need more. What else do they need? Their, their lineup is set. Their bullpen is pretty much set. Their starters now with Sale. I mean, if you go Strider, Freed, Sale, Elder, Morton, it's a pretty and good Lopez. five, right? What, what the hell Lopez. else do they want? If Sale is healthy, listen, this is going to be a great deal for the Braves if Sale is healthy. And Scott, just because you said, oh, they won't pick up that option, we just saw Lucas Giolito almost sign for $20 million a year. A healthy Chris Sale or Lucas Giolito, who's better? Sale. Well, then there you go. I mean, then it's not a foregone conclusion. They're not going to pick up his option. I think, I think this is a great sign for Atlanta. They got nothing but upside. He's missed like almost like four years in a row now. I mean, Chris, poor Chris, um, you know, if he stays healthy and he does what he's supposed to do, which is be a lefty. And even if he's not the Chris sale, like 12, 13, 14, 15, but he's just a better than average left-handed pitcher. This is a big pickup for the Atlanta Braves. Yeah, this guy, I mean, we're, we keep talking about the Dodgers here. Dodgers added a guy that just for the first time threw more, threw more innings than Chris sale. The Dodgers, you know, Yamamoto isn't going to make all his starts. So for the Braves to pick up a Chris Sale for $10 million, the competitiveness that he brings, the fact he's won a World Series, he's to me, he's a guy that fits in anywhere if you're looking to win and the Braves are looking to win. But for me, like the $10 million for him, that is a steal. I, I don't, I don't understand – like, even if he only gives you 20 starts like he did last year, which I don't think he's going to, like, this guy wants to be out there, he might give you a four, four and a half ERA like he did last year with the chance of Chris Sale kind of returning and being a three, three and a half guy. And then you're looking at 
the dude strikes out more, you know, over one batter an inning. So I, I just, I just, I love what the Braves are doing. They even, they've added to an already good lineup with just depth. They've added to an already good rotation with depth, but not just like kind of minor league depth. They've added quality depth with Jared Kelnick, with Chris Sale in the rotation. Like, and that's what they needed. Like, they didn't have somebody. Wouldn't you have loved to have gone into the postseason last year with Freed kind of how he was coming in? I think he was sick before. or No, he had the finger thing. That's what it was. It was sick the year before. Being able to slot in as number three, or if Morton is healthy, you can throw Sale in the bullpen to cover three innings. I mean, he closed out the World Series in 2018. I, I love everything about this move for – for the Braves. They just keep hitting all the right buttons. And Alex Anthopoulos has been very crafty with the way that they're handling money. I mean, for many teams across baseball, they've been looking to cut payroll. Or if they're going to make a move, they have to cut from somewhere else. So let's show Dave O'Brien's tweet, and he's going to join us later about this. He said the Braves assume the contract when they trade for sale, which means the $10 million that was to be deferred until 2039 from his upcoming salary is still going to be deferred, okay? So the cash outlay for ATL with the deferred amount and the $17 million coming from Boston is $500,000, which is less right. than the MLB minimum salary. Did that make sense? Yeah, Can just I didn't. Ask, yeah. Can I just ask, what are the Red Sox doing? I know they're trying to cut money, but they sent $17 million. I mean, I guess they saved $10 million, not really. So they basically just didn't want Chris Sale around? No, they I mean, saved they, 10 and change. What are you talking about? They signed Yeah, but Julio. not until 2039. It's still money. Yeah. I mean, but that's 15 years from now, Scott. I mean, 10 million in 15 years with the way, you know, things are going, that could be like $5 in your pocket. So, I mean, I don't know. It, it just seems like, what are the Red Sox doing? Not only do they bail Chris Sale, like if David O'Brien's math is right, which I'm guessing it is, I mean, they're paying him 500000 for this year. And the Red Sox go out and sign Lucas Giolito for a two-year, almost forty million. Like, that's great for Lucas, but man, that seems like what are they doing? They're trying to cut costs, but then they're trading away a guy that's basically, you know, making nothing for him this year. You know, by by the way they, I don't know. It just it's 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 a weird way to operate if you're the Boston Red Sox, and you know why the Red Sox fans are so aggravated by it. And they really like Vaughn Grissom. Maybe they listen to Alex Anthopoulos talking about him as like this hitting superstar. Which Except he, had no, he has no position. He couldn't make the Braves last year. Well, you don't have spots to fill on Atlanta. Where are you going in the infield? Yeah, shortstop was third? where he was supposed Austin to play. Riley's there, of course. Yeah. He's not a big right. league shortstop. Fair. Not a big league shortstop. You okay, so where does he at... go? Where does he go in Boston? Second. Yeah, they're going to move Story to, back. He goes to the... second. Story to short. Yeah. yeah, that's what that's what Breslow said. Breslow said he's going to be our opening day second baseman. I, I think it's – and I also think another great thing that the Braves did, this guy didn't have a spot on the Braves. And not saying that they were just trying to get rid of him. They wanted to get something for him, but they did him a solid for, you know, allowing him to go and play somewhere that he was wanted. That was a great play by DJ Stewart right there, by the way. But I, I just – I'm – yeah, I, I'm – just constantly impressed by Alex Anthopoulos and the stuff that he's is very much outside of the box compared to compared to what everyone else is doing. Like, oh, we can't find any hitters. We can't find a second baseman. Well, you know, we have we have extra. We we have what we need. We're adding to our depth. I mean, listen, I like Von Grissom as a player, and I think he's got a chance to be a good player. But you know, he's got two hundred thirty big league at bats. He came on, let's not forget, he came on like a house of fire and kind of cooled down the first year, 2022, if you remember. I know he's only 22, going to be 23 years old, but, you know, last year, OPS plus 78. I mean, it was only an 80, 75 at-bats, but still, I mean, he, I don't, you know, it's like, okay, I, I get it, but it just seems like, again, and he doesn't really have a position. I know he's going to be there every day, second baseman, and, and, and again, I hope Vaughn Grisham does great. It just, I don't know. Chris Sale for Vaughn Grisham straight up and giving a bunch of money to me. Seems like the Red Sox just kind of just wanted to bail on Chris Sale at this point. Yeah. 
I don't, I don't get it. That's I, the only thing I don't understand is maybe is there's some kind of like CBT that there's some some kind of tax something that is being eliminated to keep them under. Like I don't know how this. How does that 17 million that the Red Sox are sending to the Braves? How does that go against their CBT? And I I don't know how to read that, find that, any of that stuff. I just think they a are giving up on Chris Sale, who only has one year left. The contract has been an utter disaster. Chris would say that himself. They just signed Giolito. You would hope that they're going to do more on the pitching side, as that's what Craig Breslow said. And the Red Sox desperately needed better pitching last year. They didn't even have a dude that posted 160 innings. That's part of why, at the very least, you pick up a guy in Giolito who's been very durable. They must really like Vaughn Grissom. And you do get a player in Grissom who you now have control of for a long time. And if you plug him in there and think that he's going to be an above average bat, which is certainly potentially there, they're starting to develop a really nice young position player core. So just presenting the other side here. Let's table it because we'll get some more Boston talk coming up pretty soon with Tony Maserati. So um, Giolito, two years, $38.5 million. Uh, we'll get to that with him coming up in just a second. Can I sneak one in? I want to jump down a little bit to uh, to the Mitch Garver move. Two years, 24 million bucks. Um, and that one was on the 24th, by the way. Sneaking in a little. Mm, fam's going to be annoying at Christmas. Let me lock in 12 million a year for a two-year period, which for Mitch Garver, is a massive haul in terms of money. It's a guy who has been a great bat the last several years, but hasn't been paid like that before. Hasn't kept himself healthy at the catcher position. I don't think he's going to catch much with Cal Raleigh, who's one of the more durable catchers. And they did acquire Sebi Zavala um, in the trade with the Diamondbacks. So you plug in Garber for your DH spot. It's a team that struck out too much and still needs more impact bats and pop. I like this move to try and start winning back some favor from the fan base, Kratz, because if this is all Seattle does on the offensive side, it's a disaster offseason. But if they're going to keep plugging away at the lineup, I like this to plug in at DH. Obviously, there's a big injury risk, but I'm a Mitch Garber fan from what I've seen at the plate from him the last several years. He's one of the best four-seam mashers in baseball. Mashes the heater, but he's going to fit right in. He strikes out a ton, too. Based on that <laughs> bats, you know, strikeouts per at-bat, they didn't, they didn't get away from that. So they, I just, I didn't see him going to Seattle and I thought he would honestly get a three-year type of, you know, some kind of like three years, 40 million type of thing. No, three years, four, three years, 32 million. Sorry, too high, but it's awesome. I, I don't see, I don't see him going behind a dish, but I also, you know, where's he, you know, are they going to be? Are they a team that's in play for like a Reese Hoskins or does this take them out of that? Is there, what, what exactly are they looking for? He's a right-handed pool hitter. He is dead pool. And that stadium is tough to be a right-handed pool hitter. You can hit some balls out to right center, right field, pool lefties, some oppo, but you got to get on it. But they saw him a lot too in the division, him playing for the Rangers. I am, um, I feel like they have to do a lot more. I didn't think they were going to do anything, so I guess this is good that there is a there is a pulse in Seattle, and it's not all just trading you for me. I mean, it's something, it, AJ? something's better than nothing. Mitch Garver's I, a nice player. He's not going to catch yeah. a lot. He hardly caught in Texas. You know, it's he, a DH. He's a DH strictly. Does it take him out of Reese Hoskins? Absolutely, because Reese Hoskins, they already have a first baseman. Ty France is their first baseman, so first is covered. DH is now covered by Mitch Garver. I don't know. I mean, listen, it's something for DePoto. It's something for the Mariner fans to be excited about, but at the end of the day, this doesn't do much for me. It doesn't really – doesn't put him over the top. doesn't really change much. I mean, they basically changed, traded Suarez and Teoscar Hernandez for Mitch Garver. <laughs> Not it. Sabermetric, darling, I will say. Ooh. Who? Uh, for Jerry Depoto, Mitch Garver. Mitch, oh yeah. Yeah, you know why? Because he doesn't get overexposed when he plays too much. Because he, if he plays too much, he gets hurt a lot, especially catching wise. And he mashes lefties, so they always put him in some advantages. And they, and listen, if yeah, sure, that's great for Seattle if you have that ability. But they need dudes that can play 150 games and mash and and 
be out there every day. That, that, that Mitch Carver is not that guy for you. Yeah, but if he's a DH, don't you think that helps the cause? If you basically say you're not catching at all, he didn't catch no. at all during the playoff stretch, and he only made one start at catcher in September. I'll throw some numbers at you that Jerry's definitely um, drooling about, maybe giving them higher than a 54 percent chance of getting to the postseason. 98th percentile chase rate, 83rd percentile barrel rate, 500 slugging percentage. His OPS plus this year with. 100 being league average was 134. That is not even above average or good. That's great. And the DH spot for the Mariners this past season is a 677 OPS. So you are getting a boost if you're plugging okay. in numbers. And that's a, that's a math equation going on over there in Seattle. We know that. So are they going to pick up Jock Peterson to play against, to play against uh, righties? Like we talk about pitchers all the time. Pitchers making 30 starts. If you're talking about Mitch Garver as a starting pitcher, he's making like 18 starts. Like he's got, and I know there's injuries in there. And, you know, he's got 344 plate appearances last year, 215, 243. Like if he is your everyday DH, there's some regression to that OPS plus. You're not putting him in against that strong righty. Now, if you get a Jock Peterson type of guy, which, you know, would be a decent platoon slash we'll throw him in the outfield kind of thing. But I just – I don't know. I don't I don't know. I feel like you platoon because you have to, not because you're finding value. But that's a completely another situ other discussion. He can hit lefties and righties, though. You're saying platoon because of the injury situation? Like, I mean, he did he have all of his power played. against. Yeah, I understand. I, I think the bet is, okay, he stayed on the field for the most part the last couple months of the season because you took away the position that causes the most injuries in the sport. He's never had more than 311 at-bats in a season. And that's kind that's of big. significant. I want this dude to get 500 at-bats in a season. But he can't stay healthy. His his record is 102 games. You, you know, that was when he was 27. He's 33 now. I know he's not going to probably catch, but can you keep him healthy? And you can't. You just guys tell me this is perfect, though, Kratz. You guys are both catchers. If a guy suddenly completely ditches the position, or he's a third string emergency situation Mauer, catcher, going to the Hall of Fame, five to ten starts. How much does that help the cause? And Mauer dealt with a ton of concussions, right? How much does it help? If a guy suddenly is just going up there for ABs, come on, that's that's going to help a ton. The percentage chance of him making many more starts is much higher if he's just a DH. Just throwing that out there. All right. Uh, we'll get back to some other moves, some smaller moves. We're going to go to the Red Sox again here in just a second. But first, a little reminder. Use discount code FOUL, F-O-U-L, for 20% off your first order at Tiza Energy. Dot com. Okay, ready to bring in our first guest of 2024, making his FT Live debut, host on 98.5 The Sports Hub. Um, actually worked together for a little bit of time back in the day at MLB. Tony Maserati joining us right now. Tony, how you doing? Great to have you on. You too, guys. How's it going? Really good. Happy New Year. Probably better for us than for you because now you're covering a mid-market team, which for uh -huh. many Small years market. of your Small life... Market. <laughs> Small market? Okay, yeah. AJ. <laughs> They're chasing the Rays now. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so let's just get right into it, Tony. So Boston, we just talked about, picks up Lucas Giolito, sheds the salary of Chris Sale. I personally like Von Grissom, but overall, is there a lot of money maneuvering going on for them to stay in a certain range in your mind that we're not used to seeing? Yeah, definitely. Look, I, I don't know any other way to explain it. So... Uh, and I think people here, frankly, are pretty frustrated. One of the advantages you have as a big market team, in theory, is that you can beat people to players because you have more money than they do. And now the Red Sox are taking themselves out of that market. And they've done it for a few years. So, look, I just don't see how you can expect to compete in the, uh, in the AL East for one thing. But I would even go further and say with the real heavyweights of the game, if you're not going to approach it the way they have for, you know, the large majority of this ownership. And I, I, I seriously question whether they want to win uh, as much as they used to. I don't think they do. 
I feel like you're leaning towards an ownership, really wanting to win or not. And I ask every Boston person, every media personality, is 2018's World Series championship the thing that has caused the ownership to be like, we didn't really go all in. We did. We were okay. Like we spent some money on the people that we brought in, and we still won. So why spend money? Yeah. Look, I think that's part of it. I I think that look the the, the success of the Rays I think has infected everybody because there is this attitude now, and it's not just in Boston. It's in a lot of places that not every place, but a lot of places that you can patch it together contend and get into the playoffs and then maybe catch lightning in a bottle and win that way. And I still think there's a significant history that shows the best way to win is to spend, you know, certainly you have to draft and develop. That's always been true in any era. But I think that at some point you take it to an extreme and it goes a little bit too far. And look, just quickly on that 2018 team, and I understand what you're saying, but that team ranked number one in the majors in payroll. So now they're down in the middle of the pack. That team had a lot of star power. They went out and signed J.D. Martinez at that time uh, as a big signing. They traded for Chris Sale. They had David Price on the roster. So it was a team that was expensive and was the best team in Red Sox history. To me, at least you know on paper now, when I'm talking about the number of wins, they won 108 games during the regular season. They won another 11 in the playoffs. So I look at that and say, well, there's a direct cause and effect Somehow, this ownership group, and whether it's because they are now more interested in other things, whether it be hockey, the NBA, PGA Tour, whatever, that uh, baseball is not important to them. And I think that, you know, to me, I don't judge them by what they say. I judge them by what they do. And what they've done is cut back with the more aggressive expenditures. The, the total dollars are still north of $200 million. But they've taken themselves out of the market for the superstar player. And superstars in baseball win in October. I think that's proven. Tony, does this also – Crouch asked about 18, but what about 13? Because when they won in 13, you know, people will say they shouldn't have won. I was there in 14, you know, at the start, and I saw the team. And, they, I mean, just, you know, the whole bombing and the Boston Strong, they just came together and won, clearly. And then you talked about 18, they had the highest payroll. So I think there's a misconception that they weren't spending in 18 when they really were. And now you look at it and you say, okay, they, they weren't really in on Otani. I mean, they said they were. They weren't really – I mean, Yamamoto, yeah, but they didn't want to go to the point. They get rid of Bloom because they had – you know, his first move was trading Mookie Betts because of money. So now Craig Breslow is the new GM. How tight are his hands as the new GM, uh, director of player, uh, baseball operations, whatever you want to call him, how, how tight are his hands? And is that why maybe nobody really wanted this job? Because – there were so many rumors that, hey, nobody wanted to take this job. Is it all on ownership? So, AJ, I think a lot of it's on ownership. And uh, I think a lot of it's on ownership for all the reasons you said. Ten people, ten, turned them down to be the chief executive. Now, say what you will, okay? So, but Boston is still one of the preeminent franchises in the game. It's not the Yankees. It's not the Dodgers. But if you wanted to compare, you know, I, I just think there are certain franchises in that in those crown jewels. And I think the Red Sox are one of them. Red Sox, Dodgers, Giants, Cubs, Yankees. These are the teams that every year lead the major leagues in road attendance. And I've always thought that that was a really uh, important statistic because it speaks to a fan base around the country. And it also speaks to a team or a franchise that fans will go out to see. And uh, I think now they really kind of stained the identity of the franchise. I, I, can't, I, I keep going back to that number. Ten people said thanks, but no thanks. We don't want to run the Red Sox. Part of that is the spending. Part of that is the fact that they've swapped out general managers and chief executives like their utility players over the last 10 years. So Alex Kaur is now working with his third GM. And let's not forget, he was suspended for a year in there as well. So my point being that, you know, they're changing GMs constantly. It doesn't feel like there's any cohesion or long-term plan. They just react to what happened in the most recent year or two. Uh, and I think that there is a little bit of a difference between High and Bloom and between Craig Breslow in that Bloom had the chance to trade away Chris Sale and didn't do it. Breslow did. 
Now, maybe he got more than High and Bloom wanted at that point in time, but I think that Breslow has a little bit more conviction uh, and frankly, you know, has, has probably has more guts uh, than High and Bloom did. But I think the core philosophy is being set by ownership. I think that they are hiring people that they know will implement the plan they watch impl- want implemented, which is that Tampa Bay model. And, and in a place like Boston, I just think that that stinks. Tony, they're, they're not the Rays. They're the frickin' Red Sox, okay? And, and remember, don't you miss, don't all the Red Sox fans miss the days when the Yankees would go sign somebody? Oh, and the Red Sox would answer by signing somebody, and then the Yankees would sign. And it was just back and forth. It was like ping pong, right? Oh, oh, the Yankees signed Matsui. Oh, the Red Sox signed Manny Ramirez. Oh, you know, the Red Sox signed him. Oh, the Yankees signed this guy. It was awesome for baseball. And now for the Red Sox to, to operate like a small to mid-market team is unbelievable to me. Do the fans, how sick are the fans of it? I know that at the beginning of the year, remember they didn't show up and the ticket prices went way up and there was not a lot of people at the stands. And I think it was either John Henry or someone had to come out and like basically apologize to them and say it's going to get better. Well, when does this, you know, they use the full throttle. You know, Craig Breslow is going to go full throttle. When does the full throttle kick in? And are they still like on the, the slow gas pedal down instead of just jamming it down and burning some rubber here. Yeah, I, Adrian, I think the, the full throttle thing is a myth. So I think they wanted to sell people uh, a bill of goods there, make them think that they were going to go out and throw $350 million at Yamamoto. And by the way, I have not seen anywhere from anyone who covers the team uh, any sort of indication of what the Red Sox offered to Yamamoto. And I say that because I, to me, that's a bad, bad sign if you're a Red Sox fan. If, if the Red Sox had offered $350 million and said they, they would leak that, they would let you know, hey, we wanted the player. We offered him the most, but they didn't do that here, which tells me they weren't even close or he didn't want to come here or both. And I will look at either one of those things or all of them and say none of them are a good reflection on the franchise. If he didn't want to come here, why not? If they didn't want to spend the money, why not? And with regard to the, the things that you're talking about, people are frustrated. They're upset. So there, there are a couple of things that work against the Boston baseball fan right now, one of which is the ballpark. Because last season, the Red Sox attendance from the year before was basically flat. Now, I also think that that is a bad sign because much of baseball last year went up in attendance because of the rules changes and people were more optimistic about the direction of the game. Here it stayed flat from a year in which the attendance was a disappointment. So they're down about a half a million fans from where they were a couple of years ago, but they're still going to sell a lot of tickets because of the ballpark. So if you looked at any of the weekend series here a year ago, whether it was against the Dodgers, the Mets, the Braves, even the Rangers, who were here on 4th of July weekend, a lot of people traveled to Boston to see their team play and were willing to buy tickets, which are now more affordable because they'd never been to Fenway Park. So the Red Sox are still selling tickets. They're just not selling them to New Englanders like they used to. Uh, and and to me, that's a, you know, that's a, a dangerous game to play. Not to mention that uh, television ratings for the Red Sox peaked back in 07. I, I'm not, I, you know, I don't know whether you guys get into the, the nuances and the, you know, the nitty gritty of TV ratings, but at that time, the Red Sox number, just to give you perspective, was a 12, which is astronomical. It's an astronomical local TV number for baseball. They averaged a 12 in 2007. This past season, they were under a three. So in 15 years, those ratings have dropped by 75%. And, uh, and what they're doing now is not going to, uh, is not going to generate any kind of interest. I can tell you that. And Tony, we do get into those numbers. And I think that's a long-term baseball problem because on that side, it's not just the Red Sox. And there are many teams that have looked like they're in even more trouble uh, with some of the regional network deals that are going on right now. So I want to ask you more about the pitching and the Giolito signing for them because I know you commented on what that means because it wasn't a long-term deal. And even if Giolito has this incredible season, it just gets way more expensive and he goes back to free agency and you don't get to keep him. So what do you think about that signing plus the fact that in addition to the full throttle statement, this team, I felt like made a promise that you were going to look on paper and say, oh, this is a significantly better pitching staff 
and starting staff that will be able to support their relief pitchers better because nobody gave them innings last year. I think they got a long way to go to prove that. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I, really, again, I can't tell you how disappointed I was to see it. He gave up 41 home runs last year, and I'm not telling you that Giolito is, is a complete stiff. So I'm just telling you that I think in the grand scheme of things, you're talking about a guy who's been relatively mediocre if you take the whole sample for the entirety of his career. The one thing you can say about Giolito is that if you look over the last you know five, six years, he's basically made his starts, which is good. I mean, you always want that. I criticize the Red Sox for not going after guys who are healthy because healthy pitchers cost money. But in the same breath, what advantage is there for them in this deal if he pitches well? The answer is none. They don't keep him. It's a one and done. And they've been playing this game now, which gets back to you know one of AJ's points, but they've been playing this game now over the last few years where, well, let's go out and buy lottery tickets in the free agent market. Let's go out and try Garrett Richards or James Paxton or Corey Kluber. We'll sign them all to one-year deals for 10 million bucks with maybe an option or a dual option or a vesting option. And then the player has the choice. And that way, if the guy stinks because he, or he gets hurt because he's coming off of injury, we don't have to pay him as much. And in the case of those first three guys, they basically all counted 10 million a year for three years against the luxury tax and none of them were worth it. So now they go out and sign Giolito and the price has gone up because it goes up all the time. So now they're into the $20 million range on what is effectively a one-year deal. It only becomes a multi-year deal if Giolito wants it to be a multi-year deal, which means that he will have come off a bad season. So, I, you know, they just want to sign these one-year deals to mitigate their losses. And I... Call me silly, you know, they, but I, I look at teams and I say, as a fan, what I want is my team to stop at nothing, you know, within reason, to win. That's what I want. I want winning to be the priority. I recognize there's a budget. I know they can't spend $350 million every year. But what I do know also is that the Red Sox can spend more. And they've, to they've chosen a safe, um, they've chosen a path of mediocrity versus trying to contend for championships. And I think every fan here should be frustrated with that. So what's the move? What's the move that's going <laughs> to get the chowder, that's going to get the chowder hot, that people are going to be like, I'm coming out to Fenway. The true people, the people from that have been around the park for a long time. So I don't know that there, you know, I don't know that there is one at the moment. Uh, to me, the guy was Yamamoto. That was the guy. And that's the guy, you know, to me, he made all the sense in the world for them as he did for everybody because he's 25. So how often are you going to get a chance at a 25-year-old, in theory, ace? And I'm not telling you it's perfect. They always come with questions. But every report on this guy is good. The age is good. Uh, he's a front-end guy. They need front-end pitching. And so if you're asking me, would I rather have Yamamoto at 25 to 30 per for a dozen years, or would I rather have Giolito for one year at 19 million? I'll take Yamamoto every time because I know the Red Sox can afford it. So, you know, they bought this franchise back in 2000, uh, 2001, at the end of 2001, 2002 was their first season. They paid 770 million for everything, including the uh, network, the broadcast network, and the ballpark. 770 million. It's now worth over four and a half billion dollars. They have made plenty of money that they will recoup whenever they elect to sell the team and then some. So I just don't think you run uh, sports teams like you do uh, department stores and you know hardware store chains and that sort of thing. This is a competitive business. They're public trusts and you get paid back in the end. Oftentimes along the way, you run cost neutral or profit neutral or even at a loss. Uh, but you get into it because you want to win. Tony, okay, I have two questions. First, I'm going to start with the Mookie Betts thing. When, so when they did the Mookie Betts trade, they made Bloom trade him. Was that the beginning of the end of the Red Sox as we know it? Because that yeah. was their guy. I know they signed Devers after that, but that was kind of the beginning of the old guard Red Sox. And then secondly, after you answer that, how do they fix this? And I know Yamamoto, but there's not huge free agents out there. They don't seem to be making trades for stars. 
how did the Red Sox get back to being the Red Sox? Next year's free agent class is pretty solid. So are they just waiting a year, kind of like the Dodgers did? Hope everything gets lucky. Maybe you get hot and sneak in somehow and make some trades. But what's the fix for this for the Red Sox? Good question. Yeah, I'll start with bets. In retrospect, yes, Mookie Betts was the beginning of the end. No question about it. And uh, and now, look, I have my own personal doubts as to whether or not Betts really wanted to be here. So, you know, there were some discussions that took place along the way. And maybe Boston, for lots of reasons, wasn't a great fit for Mookie. Uh, you know, he's more understated. Uh, you know, pretty even keeled kind of guy. Uh, and so I think, you know, he may not have wanted to be here, which, which again, it, it happens. Okay. You know, they've lost guys in the past. You don't get to keep them all. But that doesn't mean you just like throw up your hands and say, we're never going to sign another big name superstar 20 kind of deal. And, and look, at, with regard to Devers, you know, he's the aberration. There's no question. Uh, he's, you know, he's in his mid twenties when they signed him left-handed hitter. So, and was willing to stay obviously. So I think there was some, uh, agreement there on both sides. And frankly, I think they were pressured on some level to do something big because people were pissed. So I look, I, I can tell you this. I've lived here my whole life. I covered the team for about 15 years. I, you know, I missed your year, AJ. I was out before then and have now gone into a, you know, a different branch of the media. But, you know, I, I've been a, a Red Sox follower my entire life. I have never been as disheartened and had less confidence and faith in the franchise as I do right now. And, uh, I, I, you know, to me, they, they've destroyed public trust. They've destroyed fan trust with the way they're running this thing. And how do they get out of it? You just have to hope that they get lucky in the draft. They hit on some of these guys. Now, they, they have some positional players in their system. Uh, and, you know, certainly the, the trade they just made with the Braves might free them up to trade someone like Nick York because it feels to me like there is a redundancy now there at second base. Uh, but, you know, their, their pitching is really thin. They don't have pitching in the system, not a lot of it, at least not at the upper levels. I suppose you never know what can come out of the lower levels. But uh, I just don't see them getting to world championship caliber you know, getting a world championship caliber roster unless they get some really good young pitching in here. Tony, everyone blames the ownership, clearly. Is Alex Cora to blame for any of this, though? We, we saw Verdugo take shots at him after he went out of town. He missed a year for the cheating scandal, and if you've read the Winning Fixes Everything book about him, he, he it does not shed a very good light on Alex Cora. I know Alex Cora. He's always been great to me, right? So is Alex Cora – and then there's rumors that Alex Cora wants to be the GM. Instead of the manager, and then there's things. You, if you dig deep into that, you kind of see things where he was kind of running the, trying to run the team, kind of behind the scenes, under you know. So, how much is, is Alex Cora to blame for any of where they're at right now? I mean, look, I, I think everybody's to blame, AJ. Like, I, I don't, I don't think necessarily you you are part of this whole thing and you walk away and say, well, it wasn't my fault. So, I think Cora is an excellent manager. Let me get that part out right away. And to me, in baseball. More often than not, it's the players who win the games. The manager's job, in my opinion, primarily is to keep everybody pulling in the same direction and to make sure guys are serious about what they do and to, you know, to, to manage the personalities. But the game is played on the field. Now, there are also decisions along the way that can affect the outcome of games. But if you have 108-win talent, it's hard to screw that up if you're a manager and everybody stays healthy and, and plays to their uh, ceilings. Now, there are little things along the way I would say that uh, you know, that Cora has contributed to the dysfunction. And when I say that, I don't think he and Bloom philosophically were in alignment. I think that goes, uh, I think that manifested itself at the trade deadlines in each of the last three years where Red Sox players in the clubhouse was were uh, dissatisfied with what ownership and upper management did to fortify the team. Some of those years were better than others. But the Red Sox took the, you know, they even took the cheap way out in 2021 at the deadline. They picked up Kyle Schwarber that year, and you'd say, well, that's a great move. Kyle Schwarber was injured at the time, missed two weeks, didn't play till the middle of August. And during that time, they lost control of the division. So they ended up getting in. They caught lightning in a bottle, but ultimately they didn't have the horses to beat the Astros. And I would argue that in the subsequent off seasons and trading deadlines, 
ownership and management came up short again. And I think Cora's role in the dysfunction is that the clubhouse became very disenchanted. The team lost focus right around the trade deadline all three years. They went into little losing streaks or maybe bigger losing streaks uh, during those periods of time. And I think part of the reason is because Cora was pissed too. Now, I will also tell you this. If I were Alex Cora, I think I'm a big market manager. I belong in a place that's serious about winning because I'm serious about winning. Cora's contract is up at the end of this year. He has not been extended yet. The Red Sox probably want to make it look like Breslow is going to make that decision. I have questions about whether or not Cora even really wants to stay here, and I don't blame him if he does have those thoughts. Tony, perfectly stated. Wanted to get you on for a while. Really appreciate it. Great to see you, too. I know you got your show coming up, so if anyone wants to hear more of this, 2 to 6 Eastern time on 98.5. Dude, you do four hours every day? Hell yeah. <laughs> Bring it yeah. in. <laughs> I'm, sure there's, no, I'm sure there's not a lack of calling into your show, and you're like, listen, these mass holes, they all don't understand. Well, you know, the other thing is during baseball season, it's actually five hours because they do an extra hour at the end on my own on baseball. But And right now, we're so knee-deep in Bill Belichick getting fired, you guys don't know the half of it. So Because we think that's coming down the pike next week. But you know, it's uh, it's a good market to work in. I don't need to tell you guys that. It's you know, in terms of sports passion here, it's very high, and um, I'm flattered that you uh, you had me on. So, Scott, it's good to see you, and good to see all you guys. Yeah, great to see you too. Yeah, it's four hour therapy session every day right now up in Boston. So appreciate you, Tony Maserati, with us on FT Live, and you can follow him at Tony Maserati um, on Twitter as well. Um, he's got a lot of followers you want to check out. Just full clear transparency honesty bringing it every day it's guys like tony that you need up there um who holds dudes accountable and as ken rosenthal's getting checked in we'll get to him in just a second um the other thing that i think is poisonous is we mentioned the rays what about the orioles for example first off they're flat out better than the red Sox. it's not even close right now right but they also set an example for teams that is now creating jealousy their payroll is a joke. It is so low. They're profiting their asses off. And if you're Boston and you're not playing as well, you're looking at them and you're like, those are the teams that I have to give money to. And I'm spending way more than them and I'm not as good as them. Now, I think ownership gets confused and doesn't see that they went through a six-year tanking that you just can't do in a massive market and you really shouldn't be doing anywhere. So just something to keep in mind. You know, I think there are multiple teams that are causing owners to get very lost on what the ultimate goal should be, right? Sure, you want to be profitable, but that's going to kind of come baked in within what you're doing anyway, especially if you're a big market team. You can't have it all, right? I think there's big market teams that want to be like, yeah, we'll be like a mid market in terms of spending, but we'll just rake in the dough. It's just very hard to do that from a consistent basis. Agreed? Yeah, totally. Are you kidding me? Yeah. My, que my question would be how much, how much, would a because he's a Boston fan. How much would a Boston fan need to see them spend? Because they're clearly spending. They've just used the cap as a or the tax as a cap. And so how much how much do they need them to spend of that? They got to land a big fish. They got it's not That's, just the money. Like you get the Giants. You, you like got to land a big player, a big pitcher. So let's get to Ken about it. Yeah. Well, let me ahead. before we get to Ken. Let me ask this real quick for you guys. Okay. The the the. You're talking about the Orioles, right? So if the Red Sox went full Orioles and for six years were awful, okay? Now, the Orioles are different because they also hit on, like, almost every one of their picks, <laughs> right? Not, and it's like the, the Astros did it and the Cubs did it. They kind of ruined baseball because they tanked so bad. And then the, Astro, the Cubs did it in 16, and then the Astros obviously in 17, and they won World Series. And then the, the Orioles did it for t forever, and then, boom, now all of a sudden they're good again. They, and if they win a World Series, it'll all be worth it, right? But will the Red Sox fans put up with that? The Orioles fans put up with it. Ken, being from Baltimore and understanding the Baltimore fans, I don't see the Red Sox putting up with that. The fans, that is. Not the not the organization. The organization's all for it. But the Red Sox fans, they're not going to put up with this. You see Belichick won how many freaking Super Bowls, and they're shit canning him out the door because he can't win any games. It's the same coach. It's a great way to kick off 2024 with our – FT Senior Insider, Ken Rosenthal. What's going on, Ken? We're breaking down the Boston moves. So you want to reply to that? And we just had Tony Maserati on as well. AJ's absolutely right. 
Boston fans would never go for a full tank job. Frankly, no fans should go for a full tank job. And I know fans get conditioned to trust the process and all this. Well, it doesn't always work. Work for Baltimore because, as AJ said, they tanked like crazy and hit on the picks. It takes both. And there are other organizations that have done similar things, and it hasn't worked out the same way. So that's for starters, that no one should tolerate that. And hopefully with the draft lottery and some of the other things that have come about in the recent CBA, there will be less of that now. But Boston is in a funny place because they fired Heim Bloom because it seemed that he wasn't fulfilling management's two-pronged strategy. One was to do this affordably or sustainably, however code word they want to use there. And the other was, at the same time, to build a championship contender. Well, Craig Breslow comes in because while Heim Bloom did the affordable part, the sustainable part, didn't do the championship contender part too well. So here they are. They fire the one guy, bring in the other guy. They're supposedly going to go full throttle, as their chairman Tom Werner promised at the start of the offseason. And to this point, they've not done that. Now, I agree. They need one more big move on the pitching side, Snell or Montgomery. And at that point, fans can safely say, okay, that's decent. I, got, I get what they're doing. But while I like the Grissom trade a lot for them, at the same time, they have not been as aggressive as other large market teams. And make no mistake, they are a large market team. I'm with you, Ken. And also, by the way, um, as you're welcome back, many fans saying you look well rested. So that is <laughs> Tell them a, thank you. <laughs> I, I will. That is a big compliment. And a little bit happened, not a ton, but a little bit happened during that little stretch. So that's the Boston side of things. Just wanted to get your take first off over the past week. What else stood out to you um, that we missed where front offices were supposed to be snoozing a little bit and weren't completely shut down as we saw? The biggest takeaway was the sale trade by far. Mm -hmm. And some of the other moves were interesting. Mitch Garver, Kier Meyer, of course. But no one really expected Chris Sale to get traded. He gets traded to a team that needed a starter, but was probably thought to be doing bigger things than Chris Sale. And yet the way this deal works for the Braves, it works out really well because they're essentially not paying Chris Sale anything. That money he is owed that is not in the deal. They got $17 million from Boston, but the $10 million he still owed, or ten and a half, most of it, 10 of the 10 and a half, is deferred until 2039. So Alex Anthopoulos doesn't have to worry about that. He will most likely be the president of baseball operations in 2039. Also, they give up one player, a good player, Von Grissom, but not multiple players, like you saw go for Tyler Glass now, like will go for Dylan Cease and Corbin Burns if they get traded. And you're essentially trading a guy that was going to be an interesting piece for you, Vaughn Grissom. It was kind of a safety net for Jared Kalanick in left field, but not a necessity. So the real question for Atlanta is, was Sale a big enough or good enough addition, considering, of course, how often he's been hurt in recent years? Now, I love Chris Sale. I'm a Chris Sale fan. He came back kind of nicely last year, even though he missed some time. If it works out, great for the Braves. If it doesn't, they're looking at pitching issues, maybe not just this year, but beyond. Is there a situation where the Braves come out looking like they're the winner of this trade, even if Vaughn Grissom turns into the hitter that Alex Anthopoulos said he's going to be, possibly a batting title champion? The way the Braves win the trade, Eric, is simple. If Sale is good this year, pitches them into the playoffs, starts playoff games for them, and then is good enough for them to pick up his $20 million option for next year and effectively becomes a two-year player for them, then they are satisfied with the trade. And it's a good trade for them. And in some ways, they see Sale as kind of what Charlie Morton was when they got him before the 2021 season. Morton had been hurt the year before, the COVID year, and of course has done great things for the Braves. I'm not sure we can count on Chris Sale to be what Charlie Morton has been for the Atlanta Braves, but if he is, then yes, the Braves will have done quite well. Ken, first time I can ever tell you this, you're wrong, because Scott already said there's no way they're picking up his $20 million option because, you know, <laughs> it's not Chris Sale of old and this and that. Bullshit, Scott. You're wrong again. Um, by the way, <laughs> we'll, next see. Time, we'll see. Next time, Ken, you go on vacation, can we get some decorations for wherever the 
hell you are behind you because that white wall is distracting. And then my real you're question distracted is, by a white wall, AJ? That's interesting. Yes. Normally you're <laughs> in the laundry room defect, or in a closet. Yeah, so, I, so this is a big step for you, Ken. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Which of, the, which of the big free agents left is going to be the next one to sign? Will it be Snell, Bellinger, Montgomery? I mean, I guess maybe Imanaga because doesn't he have a posting time where his time is up? after being posted. So which one of these guys do you think will be the next big name to sign? It's hard to say. And what's interesting now about the free agents remaining, the first four names on that list, Cody Bellinger, Blake Snell, Jordan Montgomery, and Matt Chapman, all represented by the same guy, Scott Boris. And Scott has been known over the years to move at his own pace. Sometimes that's quick. More often, it's deliberate. And in this case, he now has the top of the market both the position player market and the starting pitching market, as well as some other players. Reese Hoskins is also a guy he represents, Sean Manaya. So we'll see how this progresses. I don't know that you can predict it. And it's just going to be really interesting because there are so many teams still. You mentioned the Giants and Red Sox with needs. I would say the Cubs are in that group. I would say the Orioles are in that group. The Blue Jays, we can really go right down the line. The Yankees need another starting pitcher. So with all that demand, I would expect that the remaining players are going to do okay. The good ones, the guys you had on that list. Other than that, we'll have to see. What's going to drop first? The Corbin Burns trade slash, you know, the not Shane Bieber, he's not in that category. It, or is it a free agency signing and then whoever doesn't get the free agents gets the Corbin Burns, Shane Bieber type of level of players? Dylan Cease. Cease also, of course. Dylan Cease, thank group. you. I knew it was yes. one other person. How do we call And off? don't worry, I was confusing Dylan Cease with Corbin Burns this morning on a text message <laughs> chain, and that was not good. So <laughs> we're all starting a new year. I don't know what happens first, Eric. Certainly with Cease, the White Sox plan has been to wait for the starting pitchers to go. And then if someone's desperate at that point, which someone most likely will be, that's when they're going to make their best deal. Is it possible they make it before then? Is it possible the Brewers get what they want for Corbin Burns? Of course, these things are always possible. But it would seem to me that the trades would most likely, most likely, I don't know for sure, come after Snell and Montgomery. And um, in your mind, Ken, you know, I know right before uh, we got to the new year, we were talking about some teams that still have to make some, some major moves. Uh, we covered Boston, I think, plenty just now. Would the team that pops up the most in your mind still be the Cubs? You think the Giants are going to make major moves at this point? It's kind of the teams we've been talking about looking to strike. I'll throw one more team out there for you, which we'll get to this later with our group. But the Blue Jays bringing in Kiermaier and IKF after the obviously devastating loss for them to not get Shohei Otani. I think there are still high expectations for them to do some damage this offseason. I would agree with that. All of that. And I would even put the Reds in this group. I know they signed Montas over the holidays, but they could still do more. They still have a trade to make if they want to. So this is exactly what we're talking about with regard to the market. A number of teams that would never classify themselves as desperate rather than just looking because they don't want to compromise their leverage. But I would suggest that they're a bit desperate. And the Giants are in that group. The Cubs are in that group. The Blue Jays, to some extent, are in that group. I think the Orioles have to come away with a starter this offseason. They've signed Craig Kimbrell. Not enough. So a number of these teams, and I'm missing some, I'm sure, still have a lot of work to do. And that's what's going to drive this thing as we go forward. One more. What about the New York Yankees? So they come up short on Yamamoto. I don't know if we really went over the aftermath there, but – at least had the one rumor pop up that, oh, they don't want to pay for Yamamoto as much as Garrett Cole would get. How dare they? They might insult their ace, Ken. I don't know if you saw that one pop up, but your thoughts overall on where the Yankees are at, because I do think they're still trying to make a major splash as well. Well, actually, Scott, I wrote about that the night Yamamoto signed, the idea of going over Cole and whether that was a deterrent or not. They'll never admit it was a deterrent. I believe it was. And I don't know that it should have been. And if we ask Eric Cole the question, would you have been bothered by that? His public answer probably would have been, no, not at all. I just want our team to win the World Series. But privately, if you're Garrett Cole, 
What do you think? You're thinking this cat has never thrown a pitch in the major leagues and he's getting the most money for a pitcher in major league history more than I got coming off what I was coming off of in Houston? That might have been a difficult sell. And the Yankees were cognizant of that. I'm sure they were. Now, whether that was why they didn't go to 325, I don't know. But as I wrote right before I went on vacation, their offer was quite good. It had a higher AAV, $30 million a year. It had more money up front in the first five years of the deal. And then the opt-out after five years. With the Dodgers, Yamamoto's opt-out is after six. So you could argue that while the guarantee, the total, wasn't as high, the deal was in some ways better. Early opt-out, earlier opt-out, and the higher AAV. So the Yankees... Yes, they did not sign Yamamoto, but they certainly made a sincere effort, even without going over Garrett Cole. Ken, a couple questions about some teams. I know we're talking about Garrett Cole and the Yankees, and they have Garrett Cole, and they, they, made, they made the Juan Soto trade. But Otani left the Angels. What do the Angels do? And, and, and the Cubs are the other team for me. What are the Cubs going to do? Because the Cubs are on the – you know, they signed Craig Council on the precipice of allegedly taking the next step. They haven't done anything, Okay. And the Angels, they lose Otani, so they're, they're supposed to have a bunch of money to spend. They still have Mike Trout. They still have Rendon. They still have some pe- younger pieces there. What, are, what is their plan? Because nobody, no one's even talking about the Angels, and I know that I know the, the ownership, Moreno, and that is a big deal, but what are the plans for the Angels and the Cubs? Because they haven't done shit. All right, it's going to take me a while to answer this. The Cubs are obviously looking to either re-sign Bellinger or replace Bellinger. Doesn't have to be through free agency, could be through a trade. They also have to replace Marcus Stroman. I don't expect them to re-sign him, but that is another hole in their team. So both of those areas need to be addressed. Their farm system now is at a point where they can possibly make a trade even two and still feel relatively good about where they are. I don't know that they want to get sucked into the Boris trap and having to bid up his clients, Bellinger being one of them. So I would expect them to make at least one trade. The Angels are really interesting, as they always are. Now, yes, you're right, AJ. They do have money to spend. And I expect that they are going to spend some more money. Who knows how much? That's Artie Moreno's choice, and that could change any day, for better or for worse. So the way they see their team, they have the nucleus of a good rotation, mostly homegrown. Those guys were really good two years ago, not as good last year. Those players, Sandoval and some of the others, get asked about in trade talks all the time. They also have some pretty interesting position players. The first baseman, Shanuel, the shortstop, uh, Zach Neto, the catcher, Logan Ohapi. These are guys that they feel they can build around. So they're trying to supplement. They've been linked to Teoscar Hernandez. They'll be linked and will be linked to starting pitchers. I do expect them to spend. I do expect them to be relatively aggressive. Obviously, for them to have any kind of success, they need Trout and Rendon to stay on the field, and that hasn't happened. So they're an interesting team, no doubt. I don't know that we can call them a coherent team. We haven't been able to call them that in a while, but I expect them to do some things in the days and weeks ahead. Ken, it is great to see you. We have a lot of off-season left to go here, which is kind of nice for January. It's not going to be a boring January by any means. We're sometimes a little quieter. Um, Fair Territory is coming soon, so we'll get some questions, I think, from fans called out a little bit later today. And I also will end with this. The Fair Territory that you did right before um, we got to New Year's still very much applies as it's a good recap of 2023. So it is great to see you. Happy New Year. We'll catch you uh, in a few days. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it, Scott. Thank you. Ken Rosenthal with us on FT Live. Great crowd. Appreciate the questions. And I have some of the questions that I saw in the chat are Braves related. So I figured I'd save those since we do have Dave O'Brien uh, coming up pretty soon. Dave O'Brien's no Mark Bowman. Athletic. Well, all I want you to do is just capture that thought, save it, and then regurgitate it in about... Uh, I mean, it's not like I won't minutes. say that to Dave O'Brien's face. I mean, he covers That's me. what I want you to he do. Knows. He knows that. I tell him that every time I see him. Mark Have you Bowman's been on also Dave. Yeah, Mark Bowman's also twice the size of Dave O'Brien. <laughs> Poor man's Dave O'Brien. But Dave O'Brien <laughs> wears his, drives his motorcycle into the park every day. And puts his, he walks into the clubhouse. He's got his helmet under his arm. 
who has to, to oh i gotta ask you a question let me put my motorcycle helmet down before i my leather jacket before i can ask you my question is that a flex <laughs> i mean apparently yeah, for him it is he might have his own walk-up music all right let's get back to some more signings though let's hit the hot corner while we have a few minutes before we get back to the braves Let's start with the catcher position. Martin Maldonado to the Chicago White Sox to work on improving what was a really terrible defensive team. And there it is. One year, $4 million, and there's a vesting option for 2025 uh, for $4 million. So potentially a $2 million deal for Maldi. The Astros move on from him. They loved him. Their fans did. Their organization did. The bat really, really declined this past season. And they've got Yiner Diaz, who they feel really good about. And he is, I would say, at, at least at the moment, a bat first catcher, but should be able to handle the position. So Maldi moves on. And you got to go mm. with you first on this one, AJ. Do you feel did like... The fans, did the fans love like Maldonado? This? The fans didn't love Maldonado. They were... they were No, they wanted Diaz. Trust me. I did the... This play- past season... I'm saying overall, over this past. Oh yeah, I mean, of decade, course, he, you know, he, he was great for him. But they they wanted him out. Trust me, the fans wanted him out. The front office wanted him out. There was one guy that was in his corner the whole year. It was Dusty Baker, and Dusty Baker kept running him out there for his pitchers. Verlander wanted him. Fran Valdez wanted him. Christian Javier wanted him to catch him. But trust me, if it if it was up to the front office, Martin Maldonado would have been the backup, and Yiner Diaz would have been catching every day. So so that, that's not really. You know, but listen, for the White Sox, it's a great, it's a great move. They got nothing to lose. Uh, they're not going to be very good this year coming up because they just don't have the horses, and, and they're kind of in the middle of a. They won't call it a rebuild, but it is what it is. Um, with a new front office and everything, new, 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 new coaching staff, new kind of everything other than the manager. But my question is, who did the White Sox have before this? They had Max Stassi, okay, Corey Lee, who they're high on, but he was five for sixty-five last year. I mean, five. Those are Eric Kratz kind of numbers with twenty punch outs right there. Ooh. So, I mean, listen, yeah, Maldonado is a great signing, and if he works out really well for him, guess what they can do for him in July? They can trade him to a contender. The thing that's most surprising about this to me is Maldonado. We would have thought would have signed with a contender, but the White Sox can offer him two things: one, the chance to play every day, which is huge when you're a free agent, and if you want to keep playing, you got to get those at bats so and rack up the numbers, and two. A chance to just go and try to lead a young staff and prove your worth again. So it goes back to numbers and playing and then proving your worth. So I, I think it's a good sign. And also, Martin Maldonado is from where? Puerto Rico. Where's Pedro Grafol from? Puerto Rico. Not saying that had anything to do with it, but it might have had something to do with it. Miami. Pedro falls from Miami. He loves he loves Martin Maldonado, and he doesn't exactly know what's going on there. So Martin will take take the reins that I think that team needs to, to, you know, take their pitching staff, whatever it ends up looking like to the next level. They have a lot more problems than catcher. I think Max Stassi will get the bulk of the time, but I think Martin Maldonado was not going to get a, essentially a two year deal for 8 million from anywhere else. Victor Caratini, I think got two years, 12 million. And Martin Maldonado has a lot more rings on his finger than than Victor Caratini does. So I think it's great for Maldonado, but I think it's, I don't know, he might be a chandelier in a haunted house going to the White Sox. Because yeah, but- he's going to look at what's going on there and be like, what? I got two years of this? But like you said, he could get traded. Again, rarely do you trade starting catchers at the trade deadline as much as teams will want starting catchers because everybody, including Astros fans wanted him out because I know about hitting 191. Just like AJ said, fans want you out. They think they can find somebody else who plays once every five days. But if he goes somewhere else and is the backup, he can lead another team to the world series. True. I agree. Listen, it's a win-win for the white Sox. There's no money. And listen, Max Dassey and Corey Lee aren't going to set the world on fire offensively, but it's a way for the White Sox to say, hey, we signed a World Series winner. We have a relatively young pitching staff, so he's a guy that can lead the staff, try to teach him, try to teach some of these young catchers, whether it's Stassi, uh, uh, Kiro, the young kid they, they got for the in the, mm. in the other trade, the, the Giolito-Lopez trade of the Angels, right? And 
maybe Corey Lee. So it, it's a win for the White Sox for me. And the fact that it's just a veteran leadership position that they needed. Yep. But, I mean, is he going to help them win games? Yeah, sure. But, I mean, it's kind of like a, eh, okay, we're doing this to help for the future, not for this year. Culture change. Of course. I think that's what's going on behind the scenes. They're like, we need to massively switch up who's on this roster. Let's try and bring in some dudes that have come from winning organizations. Maldi definitely did that. So I think there's serious culture change work going on there. You know, it might not result in more talent, but the shit that was going on off the field, I think, was leading to losses. Um, but we'll see what they do. They also probably are going to trade Dylan Cease, so that's going to knock some wins off their ledger. Let's get to Dave O'Brien, covers the Braves for the athletic friend of the show. All right, Dave. I don't know how much you caught over the last five minutes, but the floor I is caught enough how you of AJ's lies. What lies did I tell? What, what lie did I tell? I have never ever walked into the clubhouse carrying my motorcycle helmet or my leather jacket. <laughs> ever. Like this, look. Like this with your leather coat on, like this, and you're like, hold on, you see that extra chair next to your locker? Can I put my helmet on it so I can ask you a question, please? <laughs> like you with a with a Florida Gators football helmet, like you played football. Hey, <laughs> hey like you ride a motorcycle. Okay, well, why'd you say I do? I do, but why'd you say I do if I don't? Uh, but I, but I have never walked into the clubhouse for that reason. I don't want to look like a jackball carrying my motorcycle helmet into the clubhouse. <laughs> Ever. Damn straight. I go to the, I go to the press Wait, if you've never done it, if you've never done it, then how do I know you ride a motorcycle and carry a helmet around? Because you've seen it in the press box. Oh, I have to put it somewhere. We don't have lockers. So I have it sitting at my where I'm working at my at my table. He is wearing a Come Harley on. Davidson shirt. I mean Harley Davidson hat. I do wear one right now. I'm wearing one, but I don't wear it to the ballpark generally. I don't think. All right. Well, well hold up. Whatever. Hold AJ, if, I, but Bowman is not twice my size. That's it's not close. Fair. <laughs> it's maybe close. <laughs> <laughs> hey, on the badass category. That's not Braves. fair to Bowman though, man. <laughs> I love Bowman. Right? Me too. He's that's true. That's true. Dave, are, are you prepared for the badass that just entered the Atlanta clubhouse in Chris Sale, I, who's not afraid to um, shit on a uniform if it's not up to his standards and who does or, bring or to, or to cut it up, right? Exactly. You know what he did? Yes, that is. Yeah, exactly I love what having he did. guys like that. I love having guys like that. I mean, believe you it or not, I like him there. Having, I liked having AJ on the team, believe it or not. <laughs> Do they have um, that, Dave? So let's start with Sale, okay? And then we'll get to Grissom. Do they have that? Do they, and how much does it help to have a guy like that? Obviously, we'll get to also the fact that he needs to stay on the field. Hey, but your thoughts they here? They had Josh Donaldson, man. And he was True. a great fit. He brought, you know, I think they might be missing a little bit of that edge. Uh, I don't think that was a the reason they got beaten the first round of playoffs. But I think that, uh, and Dansby said this too when he was here, it's nice to have a lot of different type guys, not just the same type guys. To have a guy like Josh Donaldson, who's kind of a uh, provokes things and comes in and needles everybody from the time he walks through the door, and and it's just highly, highly competitive. You know, when he goes through the tunnel, it's cussing and let's go and all that. And I, I think adding a guy like Chris Sale to that uh, to that uh, starting rotation can only help. I mean, you you don't have one like him in that rotation. I mean, I guess Spencer Strider, you could say, is is uh he's a power arm and all that but he's a really intellectual guy and uh uh off the field off the mound strider's not like that at all so uh, i think having a veteran to kind of go with charlie morton who's the most mild-mannered nicest guy on earth charlie morton who's 40 charlie adds a ton to this team but i think chris sale will add from everything i've i've heard about him from what aj said and what tyler flowers has said who caught him uh, everybody says highly, highly competitive and that uh, great teammate. And that's all I need to hear. When when other teammates say he's a great teammate, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what we think or what fans think. It's what what players think. Listen, Chris Sales is far from a prick. Okay, let's let's. He's not he's not uh, he's not even close to my level. So let's uh, let's <laughs> just get that out God. there. Let's Thank just God. let's yeah let's just get that out there right now. Chris Sale is is one of the best dudes I ever played with, okay? And, and his locker was next to me after Burley left in 2012, and he's one of my favorite guys I ever played with. 
And, and I think he'll bring a lot to the – what he'll bring is, listen, there's some veterans there, obviously, Freed and Morton. But he'll also bring a different attitude. And, like, Chris Sale doesn't put up with shit. And that doesn't yeah. mean you're a prick. What he'll do is he'll give his opinion and he'll say, hey, this is what I feel and this is what I think. And he'll stick by it, but he does it in the right way. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, he cut up some uniforms. He's broke some TVs. But, I mean, who hasn't done stuff like that in their past? So, listen, he's competitive as they come, and he'll fit in perfectly, especially think about if he's their fourth starter, he's matching up with team's fourth guy on on every fifth day, and he wants to pitch. And if he's healthy, I think this is one of the best moves Alex Anthopoulos could have ever made. I agree. I think he's a great ad, and it's a low-risk move. Sure, as as Kenny mentioned, there's some risk involved in the next two years because you don't have guys signed long term. But they got a twenty million dollar option on him, and if he's healthy, they pick that up just like they picked up Charlie Morton's twenty million dollar option this year. And also, if you think about how they can go, they've added yet another totally different type of pitcher. In that, uh, if you look at the other four guys in that rotation, they could go Strider, power righty, then go Freed lefty, then Charlie. Four at third, and then bring in Sale at four, and whoever they have at fifth. I mean, you could have just totally different looks each day for what that's worth. I know starters don't go seven, eight innings like they used to, but I still think there's some value to that when teams are prepping for a team, and each starter they see is going to be totally different. And then they got their arms in the bullpen are all really kind of different guys too. They don't have a bunch of the same type guys in the pen either. They have all the left-handers. They have. They got a lot of left-handers. They got a lot of them, and then they're going to have Perdomo in a year from now, too. They got him from the Pirates. I couldn't believe the Pirates let him go, but I don't think the Pirates are in a position to pay a guy to rehab for a year, and the Braves are willing to do that, look at the big picture, because Perdomo could be a steal. I mean, they picked him up off waivers, re-signed him, and uh, and they'll pay to rehab him this year, and he'll be ready a year from now. So um, that could be a big one. And they're going to have Penn Murphy, who's got a good arm. He's going to be back around a break. He's rehabbing from TJ. Um their pen is going to be potentially, I think, the deepest in the majors, which they're probably going to need because they're not going to have a lot of guys going seven, eight innings. So did you see any of these moves happening? And is Alex Anthopoulos winning the <laughs> offseason, even though I get it, he didn't sign Otani, he didn't sign Yamamoto. That's the big splashes. But he had a World Series contending team, the favorite, until all these, until all these big signings. And he's still making moves that makes people go, wow, that's a great move. Just like what AJ just said. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a kind of uh, what makes him, what separates him from a lot of GMs and president of baseball operations, whatever. Um, he has both those titles, like so many of them do these days, mm-hmm. is that he doesn't care about the public perception. He's got rock solid uh, job stability. Obviously, they'll he'll be here as long as he wants to be here. And he makes moves with the with the big picture in mind, knowing that the payroll is gone up each year and it's in the top five now. But it's never going to be where like the Yank, where the uh, Dodgers are this year, where the Mets were last year. So you still have to make moves with the payroll restrictions in mind. And also, he did all those uh, long term extensions that, while they're all great deals if those guys just stay healthy, they uh, they did bring up the AAVs higher than those guys are than a few of those guys are actually making right now their AAVs higher so it pushes your payroll up and this year they're over for the second year in a row over the over the threshold but right now they're knocking at the third tier of the threshold the 277 million which brings a lot more penalties on top of it but they can stay into that but my my uh my thing about Alex is that he just makes these moves with always a long-term plan in mind he's not a guy at the end of his career is just trying to win a world series at any cost this year yeah, he's trying to win a World Series, but he also knows they have to be ready for what's down the line, which is why they got all those young guys like Austin Riley and 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 Michael Harris and Acuna and all of them they signed so early, knowing that there's very little risk involved as long as they stay healthy and you're set up for the for the long term. All they have to do is fill left field. And if Kelnick, you know, plays the way he showed he could last year in the first 45 games. If he plays like that, they've got left field cover for the next several years. If not, they'll go out and fill that in the future. But uh, pitching is really the only area where they have to, you know, uh, starting pitching in the future where, he, where, where Alex has to uh, kind of uh, spackle over and, and make some make some good additions because he's put together a, a team that should be great for five years at least. At least. 
So what, we're not talking about a team that's like hoping to make the playoffs. We're talking about are they adding pieces that will win them the World Series? Yeah. Get past the Phillies. Why you said they can't spend like these teams? Why not? I've seen the battery. We had Sal Fasano on here talking oh, they about can if they if they want to. I mean, yeah, if so, they want so to. So you said you said they can't. Why can't they? Because they have self-imposed budget restrictions. And by, by by who? The ownership? By ownership, by Terry McGurk, who's kind of the liaison, who is the uh, uh, de facto owner because he makes those kind of mo- decisions. Ownership's out of Denver, Colorado, Liberty Media. They've got so many things on their plate. They're not worried about the Braves. They trust that, that Terry McGurk is going to make the call that they can both win and make a big profit. And they try to do both, and they've done both very well for the last few years. They got eliminated in the first round, but I don't think that that was because of the budget, to be honest. I mean, when they won the World Series, it wasn't because of the budget. They got beaten in the first round because they had four extra base hits in four games after leading the majors at, with a tied the major league record in home runs and leading the majors in every offensive category. And for the second year, having a couple of starting pitchers who weren't at their best when uh, playoffs rolled around because of illness or injury. So I think a lot of that's just luck. I don't think that you can throw money and fix things like that. I don't think that if they spent another $20 million, that would take care of that. And I think Alex working with what he has, which is, I mean, again, they're not mid-payroll now. They're at $276 million with the luxury tax payroll right now. So they have plenty of money. It's just they have it tied up long term with all these guys. The reason they don't have to fill three spots in their uh, in their lineup, they're all filled except left field. And now they think that's filled. But um, um. Yeah, they could spend three hundred and fifty million if they want, and still probably make a nice profit. But Liberty Media is where it is because they run these businesses to make a lot of money, and the Braves are making a lot of money. So as long as they have their their own restrictions on payroll, it is what it is. All right. So we're talking to a media person in Atlanta. Maybe you guys aren't tough enough on them because if you <laughs> if you unlucky. Oh, I'm going to put your feet to the fire, right? I'm, I'm feeding you to the fire because, like, let's let's do apples to apples. Like, if the Yankees lose in the first round after hitting tons of home runs, after being the best hitting team tw- twice in a row, they're getting absolutely roasted. So is there just a different expectation in Atlanta? Like, oh, hey, you know what? We're lucky. Gee, golly, gosh, darn. Because yeah. Liberty Media is taking that money and putting it in their pocket. Because what happens if it happens three years in a row? Now is there a fire that we don't know? We smell smoke, but we can't find the fire? You know, what you're saying would might be an issue if they didn't literally lead the majors with 104 wins last year and went 101 the year before. You're saying that if they had a payroll $20 million higher, it would have somehow been different in the division series against the Pirates? Where would the money have come into play? Yeah, they could have added a starter at the trade deadline last year. They could have, and they probably should have, but they didn't. And their payroll is what it is. I mean, they've got teams like the Boston Red Sox who are printing money at Fenway Hmm. Park. The Chicago Cubs are printing money at Wrigley Field. The Braves have a payroll higher than the Boston Red Sox, which never was the case for a long time. Going back, you know, you'd have to go back into the early 80s when the Braves used to be top three in the payroll every year. But for a long time, they were down in the bottom half. Whereas the Red Sox, everybody knows, look what they charge per ticket. So I think they have a gripe and those fans should be upset. But the Braves are winning 101 and 104 games last year. If they go to 90 wins next year and it's because they don't have enough starting pitching or you know, I'm not even going to say if they don't have enough hitting because they've got enough hitting. You can't <laughs> complain about their hitting. I mean, they can't be any better than they were during this season. So I, I don't think that the payrolls become an issue yet. If it wasn't going up each year when they've been making all this money hand over fist since the uh, battery opened and especially since they won the World Series, if they weren't raising payroll every year, there would be a legitimate reason to gripe. But they are raising payroll, so it's kind of hard to to – to argue with what they're doing. The only teams with higher payrolls are in the biggest markets in the country. All right, Dave, I have two questions, a a non-serious one and then a serious one. Did I, first one, did I see you just grab a cat and put it on your lap? I did, man. That was dusty. 
You know, you know what people, you know, people have told me never trust a man with cats. So, I mean, that just I proves you're care. lying about your motorcycle. Home. I don't care what people say, man. I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. I'm too right, old to give a shit about that stuff. <laughs> All right, good. That's good. That's a good answer. Now, um, here's my serious question. With the, with the addition of Chris Sale, and then you have Morton, and then you have Freed, and then you have Strider, obviously, he does your one. What does this do for Ronaldo Lopez? They just signed him, and he was supposed to be stretched out to be a starter. So does yeah. this eliminate him being a starter, or does this put him into more of a, a swing role? Does this put him into a later inning role? Because that was kind of the thing. They signed him and said, oh, we're going to give him a chance to be a starter. But if you already have four and you know you throw an elder and you throw in some other young guys, they yeah. have more than five starters already. It's a great question, and I think it's to be determined. They, uh, If you take what Alex said at face value, he said when they signed him, they would get him to, they were going to get him stretched out to start this winter and at spring training, then make the call on where he could best uh, be used. Right now, you could argue that he would bet it best be used as the fifth starter in a loaded rotation because they have added so much to the bullpen. But you could also say he's been more effective in the bullpen. Maybe that changes. Maybe he's made adjustments and what he's throwing harder than ever. And maybe he can temper that a little bit as a starter and still be throwing 97. I mean, this guy's nasty, as you know. Uh, he wants to <clears throat> do it, which he, whichever role he said. He said the day this, with, that uh, Brace signed him, he told us that uh, whichever role, they didn't give him any guarantees, whichever role they want to use him at, he's good with. And he seemed to be sincere about it. I don't know if he has a preference. Most guys want to start if they can until they've, until they've proven they can't do it. And I think uh, he's made enough improvements in his in his game the last couple of years that he deserves another chance to start if that's what he wants to do. Uh, and the Braves, at least to begin the year, could probably really use him in that role. Um, over the course of the year, they're going to use they, – they've done this the past three, four years. They've used double-digit starters. I mean, they have a, a staff that just does not stay healthy for 32 starts apiece. One guy's 40 years old and Charlie – Freed's just had a lot of little stuff. I mean, whether it's a hamstring, the blisters, uh, you know, side issues, he's had a lot of little stuff. So um, they, they uh, I think there's a real good chance that this guy's going to make, that he's going to spend some time in the rotation this year. And you have to do that early, I think, before while he is stretched out. Because if you go six weeks into the season, it's not going to be stretched out if he's in the bullpen that whole time. And then you have to work him back up to that and go start him three innings, four innings. But that's what they did with Strider two years ago. If you remember, he started out in the bullpen. He was stretched out in spring, started in the pen his first time first time in the majors. And then they moved him to the rotation uh, when they took off the year uh, that they were under 500, 10 games behind the Mets. They moved Strider to the rotation and called up Harris, and then they took off right after that. But that was, you know – at the end of uh, May. So we'll see. That was a long-winded answer. I, I think he's going to get a chance to start. But whichever role he's used at, that guy's going to be a big impact for him. Man, we saw him with two teams last year against the Braves, and he was nasty. With the White Sox, he was as nasty as any reliever I saw in his appearances against the Braves. Seriously. So, Dave, let's finish with this then. We'll, let's get a quickie here to finish up while we're on the rotation. Max Fried is the consensus top asked about player in our very lively chat right now. Chances of him signing extension. Do the Braves look to do something like that? I'll tell you my quick opinion. No. I think he's gotten this far along. You're seeing some starting yeah. pitching contracts. If he has a freaking gangbusters year and we can get the cat's opinion too, why not go to free agency <laughs> and try and rack up 200 plus mil? Yeah. It's just so hard to get a guy as the Braves saw with free or with uh, uh, Freddie Freeman and Dansby Swanson, it's so hard to wait this long, you know, and they made a, an effort, whether it's a cursory effort, if they made a legitimate effort, I'm not quite sure, but it's hard to wait this long and expect a guy to sign because now he's taken on all that risk the last couple of years. What are you offering him really? I mean, his only gamble now is that he can get to have a decent year this year because if he waits, he's going to get a hell of a lot more money at the end of a year, of a, a typical Max Freed year than he's going to get by signing with the Braves now. And he's taking on the risk, you know. He could have had – he could have blown his elbow out the last year or his shoulder. And he took on the risk that time because the Braves didn't sign him long term. So 
I'm not going to blame the guy at all if he decides now to go, whether it's back to the West Coast or anywhere else. I know the Braves would like to keep him. I know the fans love him. We all love having him here. But um, he's also going to be 30 years old as a free agent because he kind of was a late arrival and had his career delayed almost two years by this first Tommy John. Well, he's only had one Tommy John, but by Tommy John surgery. So it really puts him in a bad spot, and I don't blame him. This is going to be his one probably really big payday. He hasn't had a huge payday yet. He's gone year to year. So I I would say less than 50-50, and I say that, and Alex could do it this afternoon, just the way Alex operates. He's so covert, man. But I would (laughs) say at this point, we've really come a long way to be expecting to sign him long term. Yeah, agreed. Agreed with all of that. I mean, I, I think he should. I think he's going to have a big year, and I think he's going to go to free agency and cash the hell out. So at D-O-B-R-I-E-N-A-T-L. You can read all his work in The Athletic. Always great to have you on, Dave. Appreciate you, man. AJ, I won't spread any AJ, lies. The AJ is just coming in hot. He, in did, he wasn't even the hardest on me today. It's Kratz, man. Kratz was. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Call now it soft in the Atlanta market, man. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All that BS. When's the last time the Yankees won a World Series? I'm a Phillies fan. <laughs> uh, Yankees won one. Hey, the Yankees won one after the Phillies have. True. Oh, yeah, 2009. You're right. True. Hey, by the way, OP. The Yankees even went to the World Series. Yeah. You know? So all that yeah, holding no their feet to the fire ain't working. <laughs> hey, Dave. Dave, what these people don't understand is, you know, someone that went through the very lean years in Atlanta, 15 and 16, the Braves oh, are the man. only team to win a – title in Atlanta, right? So that yeah. 95 team, when I was there in 15 and 16, they were like yeah. gods, and then they won, did it again in, uh, what, 21. So the Braves are the only major sports team to win a title in Atlanta. So that means yeah. something, and I'm happy for what you said when they're when you said, hey, they're spending. Because guess what? If you go to a game there, there's no yeah. better atmosphere than the battery. I mean, 10 o'clock in the morning, there's people yeah. out there in the battery for a 7 o'clock game. It's um, it's the it, it's what every team strives to be, and I'm happy that the Braves are putting the money behind what they built. Yeah, it's a cash cow. They're making money and winning, so can't really complain Dave, about that. Man. Hey, they're they're doing it right, so we'll see. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, there's a lot of time left in the off season. Alex is taking advantage of some teams that have to cut payroll, so maybe there's more to it. But it's and, good and to see, you, man. We'll we'll starter, bring you back for the next move. That's the thing about having money is if he needs to add a starter. They're got, they've got enough offense and enough pitching that they're not going to fall out of contention, period. And if he needs to add a big-time starter at the trade deadline, he can do that. He has the mm-hmm. money, and McGurk will okay that. So they're in a lot bit different position than a lot of teams. They're in a good spot. And he will so Braves, do that. Back to, yeah, back they will do that. Exactly. Days, he, made, yes. he made big yeah. moves. Yeah, yeah Braves will. fans, I know. I mean, they still got two months to complain uh, before the actual season starts, but – they're fine. They're living good compared to many teams that were having therapy sessions for on a daily basis. So, Dave, good to see you, man. We'll catch you for the next move. All right. All right. Thank you, man. (laughs) Talk to you guys later. Cheers. Appreciate you. Happy New Year. Dave O'Brien, you can read his work in The Athletic. Okay. I want to swing it right to a story that emerged over the last couple days with really a continuation on what's going on um, with the Rays' best player, who we didn't see at the end of the season, but um, let's get to some news on Wander Franco and Hector Gomez has been following this pretty closely. He said Dominican prosecutors raided two houses today uh, in DR in search of Franco, who was not present on any of the two houses. And you know, I don't know. I'm not going to try and speculate how all the you know the legal ramifications work out there, but we'll kind of go off of Hector first. Um, source new evidence found in the case of Wander that further implicates him in the accusations that have been made against him of alleged relationships with minors. Um, so that was the day after Christmas, the first tweet that he was reporting that uh, for the search um, that they couldn't find him. And then the other tweet was from later that day. And then yesterday after meeting with prosecutors for about three hours um you have this tweet from espn wanda franco was arrested monday in the dr for missing a meeting with investigators regarding allegations of inappropriate relationships with minors um and then a follow-up from hector gomez on wednesday wander will be taken in front of a judge to be arraigned the prosecutors are expected to ask for wander to remain in jail with no bail as the process continues so at least from what we're looking at publicly, this is going from bad to worse. I mean, you have a, a 
major league superstar player with very, very serious allegations who is currently in prison in the Dominican Republic. I don't know how you know much we can go off of since there's still so much that needs to be made public, but you know, we can comment also on the baseball side of things. Speculation, but I feel pretty confident in saying that there's almost no chance Wander Franco is playing baseball in 2024. There's much more serious shit to be dealt with if there's any truth to what's going on here, which is freaking terrible. And it doesn't look like everything's necessarily being handled well to get himself to court to represent himself. I think there's been maybe some lawyers changing around too. So if you're the Tampa Bay Rays, you're probably going to be without your major, major player, your your top player. I mean, he's one of the best players in terms of wins above replacement this past season. They're paying him a lot of money, although he won't get paid probably this coming season. So we haven't really touched this much, but it's not like the Rays are going to go out there and acquire some big bat. I, I think there's a chance that the Rays take a step back this coming season, not to mention the fact that Tyler Glass now is now on the Dodgers. Do you guys agree? Would you be surprised if the Rays are not a playoff team this year? I know they prove us wrong pretty often, but I think we're sneaking past the fact that even on the pitching side, I mean, they've done a great job of developing guys. I mean, they have a number of players that underwent Tommy John surgery that were in their rotation that are either coming back later in the year or not coming back at all until the year after. I wouldn't be surprised at all if they weren't a playoff. But we say this about the Rays every year. Yep. I mean, but this was their guy. This is the guy they gave the huge contract to. The first one, really, of the Rays that they've said, hey, this is, you know, $100-plus million contract for a long term. They thought this guy was going to be their superstar. And it's a shame what's happened. We don't know. Again, we don't know the whole extent. But, uh, I mean, I really only have one legal question, and you guys may, might know the answer to this. Can the Rays void the contract? They don't have to pay him, right? Can they? Is he like suspended or is he like on the commissioner's exempt list and the Rays don't have to pay him? Does that count against payroll? Like there's a lot of baseball questions that I'd love for somebody that knows way more than I do to answer for me. I don't think you can void the contract. I don't think that's ever been a thing. But I they're not going to pay him if he doesn't play. Yeah, but that could be for this coming season. I mean, at some point, like there is He's a chance. He's in jail. Yeah, currently. But there's a, there's a chance that in the future – it could go a number of ways. If, if he doesn't serve any time, if he doesn't actually get accused of things, also the legal system down in DR works differently from how it works in the United States. And yeah, I'm not going to act like I'm an expert on that front. Um, you do have a player that was you know, under significant allegations and ended up serving time and then got deported back to, I believe, Venezuela in, uh, was it the Felipe Rivera or Felipe Vasquez? Um, so that ended up just being done. I don't, I think they stopped. Yeah, but he didn't have a Wander Franco me. contract. He had a contract, though. He had a contract, though. And I think that all went nice away. $17 million contract. Yeah. Now, there, uh, the stipulate, you you do have to pay your players. So if you just, like, say, okay, I'm axing this guy, you have to pay him. But if the league suspends you, then you don't have to pay him. That was kind of the whole, that was kind of the whole Trevor Bauer thing when they suspended him for 300 and I think the first one was 360 some days was how many so that was how many games he got suspended for that got reduced and then they and then the Dodgers were like we're cutting ties with this guy you know no legal action or anything we're cutting ties they paid him Wander who knows if he goes to jail but more importantly for the Rays you allotted this money you allotted this money you can't just go out and spend the money that you the 182 million you allotted on somebody else because Players like this don't come along. This is a this is a 30 stolen base, five and a half war player that was manning the primary position. And you were making your you were making your organization revolve around him. This is different. He did something wrong. Jose Fernandez died, but the Marlins, after he passed away, like he was a central piece of that organization. And organizations have a tough time coming back from losing a superstar. He's a bona fide all-star superstar who was 20 – what is he, 22? He's almost 23. March 1st, he'll be 23. That's tough. It's tough for any organization to get past that, let alone a team that doesn't spend $13 million a year on a player for the next 11 years. 
I just don't see how he, I mean, again, this is all speculation and we hope some of these allegations aren't true, clearly, or all of them aren't true. Because, But I just don't know how, if you're the Rays, even if he's found innocent of all these charges, do you bring him back? I mean, it, it, yes. it's, you, you do? You bring yes, him back because Trevor Bauer was never convicted of anything, but he was never brought back. He was never found guilty in a court of law. Oh, so I, see, I see. He hasn't I come back. He hasn't come saying. back. Right. And, and and I mean, I'm not I'm not putting one against the other, but I'm just saying, you know, this is a guy that was signed for a long time. If you're the Rays, do you bring him back? Because even if he's there's, you know, we just talked. You, you just said, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, and if there's some of these things that have happened, you know, maybe civilly they're whatever. You know, again, I hope they're all untrue because of the, just what they're talking about, but how do you bring them back if you're the Rays? You can't, and then if you're like, okay, we'll trade them. Mm-mm. Is there a team out there? Because, again, I look at Trevor Bauer's situation and say, okay, this guy won a Cy Young. He's, he pitched pretty well in Japan, and we haven't talked about him for one second as being a possible free agent for a team that needs pitching. We did. We asked Bob Nightingale, and he said up to that point, which was about it, it, a month and a half ago, Teams are not interested. So, yes, you're right. There's also, I mean, there's so many factors. This is this is a disaster on a ton of fronts, right? Legal side, obviously the baseball side, which takes, you know, a secondary step here in terms of what's going on. But, I mean, there's a chance that, I don't know, maybe he's not even allowed back in the country based on what the allegations are. I, th- there's so many factors here. So, wanted to lay that out there. I think the one thing that we're starting to learn is, at least for this coming season, if you do separate what's going on in real life and our fun baseball world, chances of him being a part of our baseball world, at least for this coming season, are basically zero. Yes? Chances of the Rays not having Shane McClenahan in the first half of the season, which they had, you know, not having – some of the injuries that they had, and now they don't have their all-star shortstop. If if you're telling me to guess, are they going to be a below 500 team? I would guess they may win 82 games. And it's that's to me, that's a really successful season based on how decimated their roster is. Getting rid of Glass now, getting rid of Shane McClanahan, getting rid of – Well, not, not getting, getting rid, rid of, of but – He's hurt. Yeah, he's but, hurt. He's got TJ. And, and not, have, not having those three guys – Three bona fide all stars, and they still and I'm still saying they could be a team that wins 82 games. I would set the I would set their over under at 82. I think that's fair. I, well, you I, saw how they I, fell apart last year, kind of in the second half after their with, start, right? Because yeah. of the injuries, because of all the guys they lost, Kittredge and and all those guys, right? The they Rasmus lost in Jeffrey Springs. Yeah, I mean they lost a, ton, a lot more, of hits. Yeah, and then you know they still have a. Pretty good lineup, Rosarena, Paredes. I mean, they still have some guys like there. Like a 500 team after that huge start that yeah, they had. They exactly. Below so I, I just, you know, they they tanked in the playoffs. So it's just, it's just not a. It's it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for the Rays. They, I know they always find a way, but this year is going to be extremely tough. Agreed. All right, one more thing to do before we slap hands. A uh, little BetMGM futures odds because there's been moves. There have been moves to the lines as well. So let's check it out. Look how far the Dodgers have jumped. Plus 375, your World Series favorites right now. Next up after that is Atlanta, then the Yankees at plus 900. Then you've got teams in four figures, Houston, Texas, Philadelphia. But in my mind, I mean, the line also moves based on what's going on with the action. I think there are a lot of people that are throwing money down on the Dodgers to win the world series, you know, obviously injuries can happen. And we talked about this a lot right before our show closed up for a week. This is not a super team sport. Just put it that way. So you have a favorite, but the separation there is pretty glaring, especially I would say on the national league side for Braves fans, given what they did in the regular season last year. And I know they ran into a pretty hot Philadelphia team and they didn't quite show up, but. Whew, that's a big separation between those two. Almost twice as likely to win the World Series on the odds right now for the Dodgers over the Braves. I'm taking. I'm taking. I, I was just looking it up. I want to know what the field is. There's got to be odds out there for Dodgers. Dodgers versus the field. I'm still taking the field. I'm still taking the rest of the teams. I just. Yeah. I just think there's. I think twice as much. Twice as much odds 
for a baseball team is way different than a football team. And I know we're in the offseason, and I know there's still some free agents that will make that that line move a little bit. But that's crazy because you're not going to see the Braves sign somebody ridiculous. And the Phillies, what are they at, 1,100? I think it was plus 1,100 there. The Phillies, based on fan graphs, if you agree with fan graphs, it's not what we're deciding between. The Phillies have the best starting rotation, which I'm like, what? How is this How is this happening? And the Dodgers still have questions in their rotation. And you need people to start every single day. I know they're going to hit a ton of dingers, and they will rival the Braves' lineup. But that is some steep odds. And Todd was Todd was one of them who was saying, guaranteed, World Series. I mean, where are the Diamondbacks? What's their number? <laughs> they won the NL last year. Yeah, I'm just like, saying, listen, I mean, the Dodgers, the Braves, the Phillies, the Yankees are the four teams that everyone's looking at going into this year because of the offseason, and they have the best odds. Texas is right there. Houston's always right there until they prove they're not. So I, I get it, but there's some other teams out there that could be sneaky good. And with the right moves, they could even sneak in there. But if you're going right now on January 2nd, the Dodgers, Yankees, Braves, Phillies are the four. Mm -hmm. I, I got to see a lot more from the Yanks, but that's just me. I think Soto's going to have a if good If Rodon comes back, if Rodon comes back and is healthy, it's a huge step. Sure, sure. Huge. Um, so – a reminder for everyone, uh, our bonus code is FOUL, F-O-U-L, when you download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android or at BetMGM.com. Sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into your new account. Place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. If that happens, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Okay, so we are still running Kratz for 2024. Good luck to EK and you're going to have to double up sometimes, but let's slap. What do you got? Was there was there a desire for me to not do Kratz hats anymore? No, I wanted to remind everyone that it's a fresh start. I'm doubling so it up you, as as seen in the video. That's what I'm saying. This is my this is my probably my favorite go to hat. It's my gray Iron Pigs hat. A little blackout night. Wear this with like an entire blacked out jersey. It's it's sharp. It's tough. It's tough. I like the colors. So tomorrow's show. We'll feature superstar host Hannah Kaiser. Finally. Back at it. I'll be traveling back from South America so that I get to Studio AJ for Thursday's show. Yeah. There's a chance I'm going to miss my flight right now. So I will do my best here. It's a long journey. And all the way from South America, I'm trying to remind everyone in Argentina that John Fisher is an asshole. And the he stadium. is mistreating his fans. The stadium renderings are not going well. Oh, look at that no, they're baby not. Hey, happy birthday to AJ Przinski. Mm. The real birthday that passed yeah. the other day. Yeah, that That's was a great pick. That's a that model was, pick, AJ. I was only 17 in that picture, so I feel pretty good about myself. <laughs> yeah. With the Dude, wrist that's tape, a model pick. The baby Man, blues. Man, the have changed. I got all, look, there's no, no hair. Look at that. Gosh, dang it. The mesh jersey. Mm -hmm. You were definitely at the complex for that one. Gulf Coast League, baby. The only Gulf a select few of us. League can do an entire year of the Gulf Coast League and survive. <laughs> you made it. Good to see you, boys. Back at it tomorrow and every single weekday all year long. FT Live. We missed our fans. Hannah Kaiser taking over. Scott, I hope I wish you better travel than what I had getting home, so good luck. <laughs> oh, damn. I wish you. It deals. starts now. Oh, wait, except I forgot. You're flying private. I had to fly with the, you know, with the regular people. You're flying private. I took My a PJ. Bad. I took a PJ in Argentina. We'll get to that on Friday. Ooh. All right. Yeah. Big flex. Big flex. We'll talk Friday about it. Have fun with Hannah Kaiser tomorrow. See you, everyone.